You've been a member of the Communist Party for over 50 years. And if we look back at the post-war period, the Communist Party came out of the war with 50,000 members, two MPs, yourself and Willy Gallagher. That was the time when Stalin was in power. Now the whole situation in the Soviet Union has changed markedly. By any standard, it's improved markedly. We've got uh, a new, youngish, reforming leader in Gorbachev. And the communist parties in this country, between them, have less than 10,000 members, and there's not a seat anywhere in the country where a communist candidate could save his deposit. Why? Well, firstly, I must segregate the question of the problems of Britain and the problems uh, which uh, developed in the Soviet Union. The name of the British Communist Party was Communist Party, and the name of the Russian Communist Party was Communist Party. But the two Communist Parties had different conceptions of how to operate, and I think the background is clear as to why these conceptions were there. So far as we are concerned, I have always been mainly concerned with the problems of Britain and how to work in British circumstances. And many of the things which have been done in the Soviet Union years ago, which we used to regard as the result of the backwardness of the nation as a whole, and therefore which could never happen in Britain, and therefore sometimes we were even smug about that, that we wouldn't do it that way, but you can't blame them for doing it. And so, because they know not better, said we sometimes, which was, of course, is wrong. Uh, that's the position. I, I've got to explain that in the first place. With regard to the progress of the Communist Party, I think the main reason for the lack of progress and the fact that we've uh, gone back is because we haven't adapted ourselves to the problems and circumstances of our own country in any degree of depth. We've kept a certain basic conceptions for more than 50 years and we should have moved away from them. I'll give you one. At the time when we decided, after the setback in 1950 election, that we need to have a long-term program, which we did produce, and which was no been known as the British Road to Socialism, at that particular time, the question did arise of what became known in certain circles of pluralism. I had been in Parliament and obviously it could be said I was influenced by my own experience in Parliament. But it seemed to me, and it seemed to many of others, and I can name them also at that time, that this was only the first attempt at approaching the problems of our country in how we are to reach a socialist state. And that therefore, if we had to do it, we had to show ourselves as honest and straightforward and not the right to rule because we said so. We failed to do that. We failed to introduce a conception of um, pluralism. However we formed it, we were in favour of um, a form of uh, what's it, proportional representation which would have been a fairer form of election than we've had in all these years. I think a lot of it is due to that particular position which we took up. The other aspect, of course, is, linked with it, we relied to a large degree, and soundly in many ways, on the organised working class movement, the trade union movement, especially those in the major industries, which are well known. Now, it was right to do so, it's right still to do so, but not to rely on that particular factor as though it is the sole factor. That somewhere there we get into the area of what has been known as uh, not syndicalism, a thing which we always should avoid. T today, for example, there are problems which are stirring the whole world and which the Russians are now becoming alert to, the ozone problems and other ecological problems, which in many ways, from the point of view of safeguarding the welfare of humanity, are even more important than whether a steel worker gets another five pound a week or he doesn't get another five pound a week. And we have tended to retain the old balance of organisation,
and that again, I believe, though we've been heavily criticised by those whom this disturbs, that's a great pity, but I tend to believe that that was a mistake. How has the new mood in the Soviet Union affected the mood of British communists? Has Gorbachev been an inspiration or an embarrassment? Because after all, he's opened a lot of cupboards and there have been an awful lot of skeletons there. Well, I would say, looking at it subjectively for a moment, that the first influence of Gorbachev's statements in the last uh, three or four years has been to introduce a sigh of relief to the British Communist Party, who have been thinking in a very broad way along the lines that Gorbachev has stated. And the reason why I say in a very broad way is that he has been able to express views which we could never have done. The speech which he made at the United Nations in the winter recently, and the conception which he has of a world set up, however it may be formed, the steps which they have taken since to prove their word, like the retreat from Afghanistan and all the other things, is an indication that he really is clear in what he wants, and more, more he has the power to put into operation what he has in mind. Now, so far as we are concerned, we have never been concerned with the details of the running of the Soviet Union. But we've been aware of them, and I myself have been there on a number of occasions, and, and we know some of the shortcomings. He has exposed, and I believe correctly, the reason for the shortcomings, and they're now trying to change the position. It's going to be a very big problem, I think, that they will be successful in the end, and my reason for that is that there are two particular areas which matter. The area which he, in a way, personifies, and that is of the educated section of the population, and the number goes in many millions, and I think that the great majority of them, except those who are looking for cushy jobs, would be in support of what Gorbachev is doing and will pull their weight. And not least, the younger generation who are now coming forward and leaving universities every year will be following in his footsteps. The other area, of course, is the working class, and I'm lumping them all together, I'm not treating now the question of the countryside. I think that they will, I, I know the British working class, I think, and I think the same thing must apply to the Russians, that they will also want to do a good day's work for a fair day's pay, to use an old expression. And therefore they will want to see the, their factories and other institutions working, and I think that it will be a matter only of time before they respond, and therefore that his expectations there will be fulfilled. I likewise think that he will certainly have an effect how deep it will be on people like Thatcher and people like Bush, I don't know, but it'll have effect on the world with regard to his conception of one universe, which he's now mentioned more than once. Gorbachev seems to devalue and downplay some of the old, basic Marxist tenets, ideas such as the dictatorship of the proletariat. It, 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 it's gone. It's no longer part of the thinking of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. It seems to many observers that he's more a liberal than a, a Marxist. Now, doesn't that weaken the self-confidence, weaken the resolve of Marxists in Western countries? Doesn't that mean that Moscow is, is marginalizing Marxist movements elsewhere in the world. Well, let me take up one particular phrase and uh, work on that. You've mentioned dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, when I began to read Marx and the other Marxist writers many years ago and came across these expressions, I, came, I read them against a background of the state of society at the time. Uh, even if you look at Blake's poem and song of the dark satanic mills, and he was a worthy person living even before the time of Marx and so on, and he wrote this to condemn that state of society which had developed, uh, that was quite justified, and the words which were used were justified, 
But many changes have taken place, notably by the efforts of the working class themselves through the trade union movement to rectify that position, and this is an ongoing thing. And therefore, I have not always, personally, I have not always accepted those expressions as meaning what they appear to have been today. They had different meanings. I think that many people who haven't thought too deeply have accepted them as they were. The question of dictatorship of the proletariat is really a very strange sounding thing that the proletariat, i.e. the working class, are going to dictate. It has no meaning really and it, uh, I don't think it has any meaning in that sense. But we've got to move sideways to the point I made before. If we're going to have a society where we have all kinds of problems apart from the most obvious manifest class problems, then we've got to have representation and responsibility from all sections. And in this respect, I must make a note, and I, I wanted to record it, that I have sensed in the last, certainly the last 10 or 20 years, that the British trade union movement as a whole, but ignoring certain exceptions, have turned in on their own limited requirements and limited ambitions. They have very rarely given full support to the peace movement. They are only now on the fringe of the ecological movement. They have very rarely given full all-out support from the membership as a whole to the great activities in other countries like the South African movement for, for, uh, uh, against apartheid. And that therefore the conception of the working class as such without seeing the role of the working class within a broader movement I think was not something which Marx, uh, Karl Marx himself, would have intended to mean at the time. The Communist Party's theoretical magazine, Marxism Today, is much criticised even within the party. Its new term is post-Fordism. That is the key to what Marxism Today sees as understanding British society in what it calls the new times. But it seems to lack any political strategy for a communist party, and it's been criticised as liquidationist, as seeing no role for a separate communist party, and criticised also for being turning the Communist Party into a left-wing Fabian society, which seeks to permeate British politics rather than to put forward its own program. Firstly, I must uh, express my own appreciation of the work which has been done in building up Marxism today, where it's now a recognised journal. All kinds of people are reading it today and reading it seriously in order to get conceptions which otherwise uh, they would not come across uh, except sometimes when they would read something perhaps in the Guardian which is an extract from Marxism today. That is good, whatever it may be, that they are learning to accept Marxism as a conception, a, a certain kind of philosophy and are looking at it as it is. Whether now Marxism today under the editorship of Martin is doing the best it can in order to create a, a movement of people towards doing things in addition to talking about things, I am not sure. In fact, I doubt it. Mostly, the position of the paper remains as a talker about a number of subjects which may be relevant at the time. I have in mind, for example, the fact that the particular problems of the day are sometimes discussed only from limited angles. For example, on the question of electioneering, so, before the last election, we had the strange position that in the very la latest issue there was an article given a lot of prominence by Eric Hobsbawm in connection with tactics. Now, it must it had to be assumed that this was relating to the ongoing election at that particular time. If that's the case, then really that's very stupid. 
because if such a an activity has to be introduced, one's got to allow one, two or three years for that to develop after many discussions and understanding between the various parties and personalities. To issue that, to publish that, at the, as the last issue before the general election, which I think was the case, is bad editorship and even to some degree mischievous. Now I'm not suggesting that Martin intends to be bad, intends to be mischievous, though sometimes he might be not such a good editor as he generally is. And in that particular instance also it was never examined. It was never really considered subsequently. I don't mean the contents of what Eric wrote. I mean the fact that it was published at that time, and Eric wouldn't have minded if it had been published later, I imagine. I'm giving that as an example of the paper where they don't really relate themselves to ongoing political situations. And the subjects which they deal with very often are dealt with too abstractly. And for that matter, sometimes the language and the nature of the expressions are also too abstract, where five syllables are used when one could be sufficient. Let me ask you one final question. It's now almost 40 years since you lost your seat in Parliament. When will we see another Communist MP? Will we ever see another Communist MP in this country? If the, if the, situa if the circumstances continue as we now see them, uh, and I'm not just relating it to the Thatcher government, but the circumstances as a whole and the position of the working class movement, I don't think it's ever going to happen unless there are changes, if we look at it like that. The other aspect, of course, is that I'm hopeful, without going into details of an organized kind about affiliations and so on, that we could reach a stage where we have a relationship with the Labour Party so that uh, an understanding could be reached while retaining the identity of the Communist Party about standing down in different areas for each other. This would only be done in a minority of cases, but it is not inconceivable. Only in those cases I do could I see another member of Parliament in the House of Commons. Right. Lady Mosley told me that her, her late husband, Sir Oswald Mosley, wasn't an anti-Semite. What she says happened was that British Jews turned against him because they didn't like the fascist label that he espoused. And eventually, after long months and years of baiting, he then decided to give the Jews a gloves-off fight and retaliated. Is that how you saw things? Firstly, one needs to be clear whether we are discussing... Mosley, or the British Union of Fascists, which he was instrumental in forming. The attitude of people as a whole was to the organization, and not specifically to Mosley. Mosley's wife, therefore, could say whatever she likes, and even if it was true whatever she says, she can't speak for the organization. Indeed, only the publications, speaking historically, can do that. And if you refer to the publications, you'll find that week after week there was a torrent of abuse against Jewish people, at the same time as there was praise for the Hitler regime. As the Hitler regime, among other things, stood for the extermination of the Jewish people, and as there was never any exception made by the BUF that they praise Hitler, but they don't agree with that, extermination, it must be assumed that the BUF was likewise for the extermination of the Jewish people and following thus in the footsteps of Hitler. Mussolini uh, um, mostly made his visits both to Hitler and Mussolini and came back full of praise for what they were doing. Mostly saw nothing wrong in the invasion, uh, in the attack that uh, the, the, the um, that the Nazi armies were making on Poland at the beginning of the war, 
and uh, wish to ensure peace with Hitler. And I think one can draw their own conclusions. The, the, the basic thing is that the documents which are still available in all kinds of libraries will prove that week after week anti-fascist attacks, uh, anti-Semitic attacks were being made by writers and spokesmen of the BUF. And Mosley was the leader of the BUF. It's one of the ironies of late 1930s politics that the great strongholds of the Communist Party and of the British Union of Fascists were adjoining areas of the East End, slightly different areas, but they were side by side. Indeed, in some parts of Methnal Green were both strongholds for the Communist Party and for the BUF. How much tension, rivalry and violence and intimidation was there on the ground? The, the violence and intimidation was sometimes organized, in Bethany in particular, as I recall, against Jewish shopkeepers, uh, and generally would follow some particular rallying event on the part of the fascists. There were very few stand-up fights as such, between a crowd of fascists and a crowd of opposition, non anti-fascists. didn't work like that. At one stage also, in Bethnal Green, in an area called Victoria Park Square, which was a place where meetings were held, we actually, the Bethnal Green Party, and I had a hand in it, we actually reached an agreement with the fascists not to interfere with each other, so that one party would say have their meeting on a Tuesday evening and the other on a Thursday. The police were very happy to have that arrangement and on one occasion when I was speaking at Victoria Park Square on the appropriate night and there was an interruption from one, assumably a fascist, is one of the fascist leaders who told him to shut up while I was talking. Now, this wasn't because we were reaching a stage of amity. We were reaching a stage of convenience, both to us and to the police authorities. That's what happened there. The fascists showed their strength only when they were really a big crowd, when they were cheered on by their leaders, and that when they marched in military form, military uh, organization, and so thought that they were masters of the world. Uh, the fact that the fascists had their head, main headquarters in Bethnal Green, well, they had branches both in Bethnal Green and in Shoreditch, and a branch in, in an area of Stepney, in the east side of Stepney, uh, and conducted their affairs there. We did not interfere with each other as such. When we had open air meetings, which we had frequently in those days, and a fascist would, and a person would ask a question, you answered him. Uh, without querying whether he's a fascist or otherwise. And you answered him partly because the rest of the crowd, the ma majority of people, would get the benefit of your answer to him, which he thought uh, would uh, uh, kind of build him up. And therefore, the activity wasn't like that, insofar as the fascists were concerned. Mainly they were violent when they felt they had the strength to be violent and when they felt they could do it despite the police, and so on. And therefore it was a question of whether the people could organize themselves to oppose the violence. In a sense then, Mosley was a recruiting sergeant for the Communist Party because fear of fascism was one of the main factors which led to the strength of the Communist Party in Stepney. Yeah, but you see, well, that point has been, was made in different ways at the time. That is to say that uh, some of the Jewish authorities, like the Board of Deputies, would say to Jewish people, don't join the Communist Party, because that would only, in turn, strengthen the fascists. And now what you're saying is exactly the other side of the coin. Well, that is inevitable. When you get a society which is so diametrically divided, as was happening in that period, Capitalist, we, we, we have always regarded, and on reflection now I still regard, fascism as an advanced form of capitalism to seek to continuate the capitalist economic system by means of the oppression and the elimination, in many cases, of working people. 
that's what we saw as fascism, that's what I see as fascism now, thinking historically. And therefore that was the position then. The communists were opposed to that, and the communists were for a democratic society. We, sh we changed our position in 19, officially in 1935, in practice before 1935, from class against class to, uh, to the unity of all people for the uh, progress of society. And that's what I believed in at the time. So I believe in now. But this coexistence you talk of between communists and fascists, this agreement not to break up each other's meetings. But, but, but at the same time, of course, you did organize on the streets against the fascists. There were clashes. There was, of course, the Battle of Cable Street in which you were closely involved. So at one time there was coexistence. At, the, at another stage there was political rallying. I would like you not to emphasize the question of coexistence. At no time was there coexistence. That is to say that if you look at it, it's narrow sense. In a certain street in Stepney, there would be a number of people who subscribed to the fascist party. There'd be some to the communist party, and there'd be others, the majority, to no party, or whatever it may be. And if at no time were there squabbles, and the children play with each other, I would expect that to be normal. And the people would do their respective jobs, and a number of the fascists would be members of their respective trade unions alongside others who disagreed with them. And the normal way that would not be and there would be no problems. I want that to be clear. What you had, as I said, is when the fascists gathered, gathered together, and when they were aroused and uh, stimulated uh, by people like Mosley and some of his henchmen, who were even more effective speakers than Mosley in some cases, it was then that they were stirred into being hostile, attacking people and abusive to people. Those, this is actually what happened at the time. With regard to what was called the Battle of Cable Street, this was a provocation, and a provocation which was a, a further condemnation of the government of the day, the so-called national government, which allowed, which was prepared to allow, a demonstration to take place on the eve of the most important Jewish festival of the, uh, of the year in October, uh, uh, through the streets of East London and many of these being in areas where there were large numbers of Jewish people. And everyone knows the story by now, which became known as the Battle of Cable Street. Well, what was done in that period was not done alone by the Communist Party. It is true that the official organizations of the Jewish people, like the Board of Deputies, and uh, the Jewish Chronicle and other sections of the Jewish people uh, told, advised people to stay away and let mostly have the streets. Most of the people in East London where this had to be march, or where this march would take place could not agree with that. It is also true that the, and I wish this to be on record, that I knew of no case where, unfortunately, a Jewish rabbi gave a lead to oppose the enemies of the Jewish people, as did quite a number of churchmen, both of the Church of England and here and there also Catholic ministers, as they did in that day. This is therefore a, a factor which split the Jewish people to some degree, and so there were many aspects of it which are not in the public eye, but now you're asking me, and I, I do mention it. It wasn't so clear-cut. When we come to the political level, without a doubt, the main political party engaged in the struggle at that time was the Communist Party. It not only took the lead in the case of the Battle of Cable Street, it took the lead in helping to form the uh, British Battalion of the International Brigade in Spain, and it was proud of doing so. But it did alongside others. And in the case of East London, the Jewish organizations, a number of Jewish societies and the Jewish ex servicemen themselves took part, despite the call to, uh, to, to, to keep away from their so-called leaders. Were black shirts a real threat to the safety, the property, the livelihoods of Jews in East London? If there hadn't been the opposition, which in the main the Communist Party led, then the fascist movement would have grown. Because the least which we did was to have meetings where we carefully and patiently explained A. What 
really were the cause of the problems which the people faced, where Mosley was trying to take advantage of, and B, what really was the motivation of the fascists in lining people up against one enemy, so to speak, the Jewish people, because that's the way in which it was put at that time. And therefore, without our propaganda, our newspapers and our pamphlets and leaflets and our meetings, I think that they would have grown and had more authority. And I think that the reason for that is that there's no doubt now, from all the books which have been written since that period, that they had support in influential conservative circles throughout the country in all areas, both industry, military, and so on. And if there had not been the opposition to expose them, the famous exposure being the one at Olympia in 1934, where they were seen brutally attacking people who had uh, heckled the platform, I think that uh, we would have had a very bad time. What is more, I would emphasize, that taking the whole situation into account that all this was part of the ongoing movement of fascism versus democracy which culminated in the World War II. It could have led to a situation in Britain where there would have been support even at the last day for further appeasement by uh, the Chamberlain government supported by a large number of fascist-minded people in the country than really was the case and therefore it had a salutary effect on British position in the war. You were in the late 30s yourself increasingly prominent in the Communist Party in the East End and in the anti-fascist movement. Did you become the subject for attack or abuse by black shirts? No, only when I spoke on the platform. And when I spoke on the platform, then someone in the crowd would shout out, go back to Russia, which I, where I'd never been, or go back to Palestine, where I'd never been. And uh, then I would be able to make a joke about it and pass on to the next thing. No, I was never myself attacked or anyone in my family attacked or abused, uh, except when sometimes there was the occasional battle on the streets and I, I took my mother's share. So what sort of injuries did you suffer in those clashes? Actually, nothing from the, nothing from the fascists as such. Once there was a police truncheon knocked me on the head and once I got a cracked rib in the course of a scuffle. I don't know who was responsible for that because I was only examined two days later.